coming out today on this, uh, it's the nicest November 19th that in memory Amen. I can remember. <laughs> My name is Scott Hartwig. I'm the president of the Lincoln Fellowship of Pennsylvania. Today, we gather here to commemorate a great struggle. The men who here gave their lives and a president who gave such meaning to their sacrifice. 147 years ago, men fought and died here in our civil, American Civil War. Around us is the Soldiers National Cemetery, a place of such historic magnitude. Set aside as a final resting place for those who fell at Gettysburg, it serves today as a reminder that freedom comes at a high cost. Although the cemetery was initially established for those who died here at Gettysburg, as a national cemetery, it contains the remains of soldiers who served in American conflicts up through Vietnam. Today, it is the final resting place for over 5,000 dead, including 3,512 Union soldiers who died at Gettysburg. Among that number are 979 who are completely unknown. On November 19, 1863, <coughs> President Abraham Lincoln came here and delivered his famous Gettysburg Address. With those brief remarks, he not only honored the fallen, he also consoled a nation grieving for its dead sons, and he affirmed America's commitment to a new birth of freedom. In the annals of history, we cannot find a more cherished address, not only for us Americans, but also for all mankind. Before us, stands the Soldiers National Monument, sitting at the axis of the burial arc. Around its base, we see its four allegorical figures, personifying war, history, peace, and plenty. The fifth figure, standing atop the column, is the figure of liberty, symbolically clutching a laurel wreath in her right hand and a sword in her left. Today, with this wreath laying, we remember the fallen. We remember that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. As president of the Lincoln Fellowship of Pennsylvania, I will now lay a wreath on behalf of our organization. At this time, I would like to invite Doug McMillan to lay a wreath on behalf of the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War. On behalf of Gettysburg National Military Park, Superintendent Bob Kirby will now lay a wreath with Mr. Michael Aitz, Senior Advisor to the Director of the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. Sam Donaldson of ABC News and Janet Riggs, president of Gettysburg College, will now lay a wreath on behalf of the United States of America.
call upon you this day as we give thanks for those who gave their lives for the sake of their fellow citizens and who rest eternally. Center our hearts and minds now and help us once again to hear and contemplate with renewed interest the words of President Abraham Lincoln and their significance for us in our moment in your history. Amen. Today we celebrate Lincoln on the very day he delivered a few appropriate remarks here in Gettysburg to dedicate this Soldiers National Cemetery. Today's keynote speaker is Sam Donaldson. His 42-year career with ABC News includes serving as ABC's Chief White House Correspondent, as well as hosting and moderating such news programs as World News Sunday, Issues and Answers, This Week, Primetime Live, and Politics Live. Over the years, Mr. Donaldson has received numerous awards and recognitions, including Broadcaster of the Year, Best White House Correspondent, three Peabody Awards, and four Emmys. Mr. Donaldson's determined search for answers and his reputation for asking pressing and tough questions made him a household name and one of America's most influential journalists. Please join me in giving a good Gettysburg welcome to Mr. Sam Donaldson. Charles, Charles, thank you very much. I was determined that if the sun stayed out, I was going to take off the top coat on the theory that if John Kennedy could stand in freezing weather without a top coat, I could observe this moment without one. But then, I'm not president and the sun didn't stay out. I am very honored to be here uh, to say a few words to mark the moment. I, I can't be as short as President Lincoln. Uh, that level of genius is far beyond my ability but I promise to be much shorter than Everett Everett's two hours. <laughs> Somewhat short. One cannot be here in this place where many who died in the battle are buried and where the battle itself was fought and not feel the great swell of history. Three days of close combat that probably decided the outcome of the war. How on the first day the Confederates chased the Federals from the town, northwest of the town until Buford rallied his troops to hold. And how on the second day the Confederates stormed up Little Round Top in vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And when the Union forces ran out of ammunition, Chamberlain ordered that fabled bayonet charge that saved the day. But I think it's the third day of the battle that has captured the imagination of history. Walk over not too far from here to the grove of trees in the stone wall on Cemetery Ridge. Look across the gentle rolling valley to Seminary Ridge, and you could almost see in your mind's eye Lee as he decided to throw the dice on that third day and charge the Union Center. And split Meade's line, roll up the flanks, clear road to Washington in the end of the war. And there's Longstreet, convinced the charge will fail, but good soldier that he was, determined to carry it out to the best of his ability on his commanding general's orders. And then Pickett's men marching in closed ranks into the Union cannon and muskets. I once asked another general, Colin Powell, why they would not have dispersed, hugging the ground as they zigzagged toward the stone wall. Because, explained Powell, in those days there were no rockets, there were no aircraft, there were no modern artillery, and the only way to bring concentrated firepower on a position was by concentrated musket fire at close quarters. So the men had to come at the stone wall in closed ranks. And of course that day on the open round it proved to be a slaughter field. In September of 1978 I stood with a small group of reporters on the edge of the battlefield watching as President Jimmy Carter explained to his Camp David guests, uh, Menachem Begin, the Prime Minister of Israel, and Anwar al-Sadat, the President of Egypt, how the battle had progressed. Begin, the old ear goon fighter of the British, used to close quarters combat, looked somewhat bored. Sadat, the old tank commander, seemed to be saying to himself, too bad Pickett didn't have a squadron of eye tanks to roll up the Union line. Well, never mind, we know the outcome. There may be a few descendants of the combatants who want to refight that war, but fortunately for our nation, there are very few. For Lincoln's great challenge voiced here as to whether this nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure was answered. We are one country. 
When Lincoln delivered his magnificent address, right here, the greatness that we see in it now was not universally recognized. His invitation to speak seemed to be almost an afterthought of the organizing committee. Uh, it was made clear to him that Everett was the principal orator, and he was to offer brief dedicatory remarks. Well, today, and for some time, presidents have been the star attraction. Take it from me, always afforded first attention. Lincoln had to wait for about three hours while everyone else spoke before it was his turn. The little two-minute address he delivered was pronounced embarrassing, in some quarters basically friendly to him. His critics, and they were numerous in the North, sneered. And what would we have thought if we had been here without hindsight being the gift of understanding? Now, as a political reporter who spent about 50 years in Washington working in the news business, I've come to believe that presentation is such an important factor, in the short run, perhaps the overriding factor, particularly when it comes to television. Candidates for public office and public officials who can look and sound attractive on television have a huge advantage over those who don't, quite apart from the merits of their positions on the issues and their other attributes. Just think of some of the prominent political figures today and ask yourself whether they would have the same following if they were ugly. <laughs> Which brings me back to Lincoln. <laughs> Had he been facing the television cameras here, what would they have shown? He was tall, gangly. His sharpest critics called him a baboon. The name callers of today did not invent political invective and ad hominem attack. And he had, we're told, a rather high-pitched voice. No, where is that big, deep voice? From the contemporary accounts, he made no attempt to project an image of all-powerful commander-in-chief. No swagger in Lincoln. But rather delivered a straightforward address, perhaps in a somber monotone. Although it is said in his last line, he stressed the word people of the people, by the people, for the people. The strength was in the power of the profound thoughts conveyed by the simple words, not in the tone and style of his delivery. And if the cable channel talking heads back then had cut loose on Lincoln after his speech, denouncing, belittling, inciting anti-government demonstrations, why it might have made the violent draft riots earlier in the summer in New York City seem ordinary. Well, actually, I think Lincoln would have done very well on television, the window into what someone is really like for the millions of people who cannot meet him or her personally. On an oh, a nine-second soundbite or one carefully constructed speech won't do it. But when a public figure is seen often and in different circumstances, the true qualities of mind and spirit come through. Indeed, no team of public relations experts can hide them and no talking heads can change the general public's view of them. Over time then, television in the 1960s might have shown us a president searching vainly for a general who would fight. If General McClellan isn't going to use his army, I'd like to borrow it for a time, he once said in exasperation. Now what a great answer that would have been to a news conference question about failure in the battlefield. Why, Ronald Reagan, famous for his one-liners, I know, couldn't have done any better. And television, always looking for a tear-jerking, schmaltzy story, would have loved to showcase Lincoln's compassionate side. Pardoning soldiers condemned to be shot because they deserted in the face of the enemy. He called them his leg cases, saying, if Almighty God gives a man a cowardly pair of legs, how can he help their running away with it? <laughs> I must tell you, I would have loved to have had a hidden camera in his office the day a mother came in to plead for the life of her son, convicted of falling asleep in guard duty and sentenced to be shot. Lincoln handed the, the woman a piece of paper on which he had written, Job Smith is not to be shot until further orders from me, Abraham Lincoln. Well, the woman burst into tears. Oh, Mr. President, I thought it was gonna be a pardon, but you say not to be shot till further orders and you may order him to be shot next week. Mother, replied Lincoln. If your son never looks on death till further orders come from me to shoot him, he will live to be a great deal older than Methuselah. <laughs> now, I know that story is usually told about a father 
pleading for his son's life after conviction for unspecified crimes. But remember, we in television love to heighten the drama. And sometimes we're even accused of taking liberties with the truth. And let's face it, mother sounds a lot more compassionate than father. But in the final analysis, it is national leadership and direction we look for in our presidents. And if we find memorable Franklin Roosevelt's first inaugural address, nothing to fear but fear itself, or John Kennedy's ask not what your country can do for you, does any of them rise to the stature of Lincoln's second, with malice toward none, with charity toward all? There with the war clearly drawing to a close, with the Union victorious, was the spirit of generosity and wisdom of leadership that the whole country would have seen immediately through television. I think the fact is Lincoln did not need television to spread the qualities that we celebrate here today. Or talking heads on television to remind everyone how tenuous was his position on that day in 1863. While it is now recognized that Pickett's charge was the high water mark of the Confederacy, that was not at all clear on the day he spoke here. Moreover, he knew, and everyone knew, he was facing a difficult and uncertain re-election campaign just the following year, the outcome of which might hinge on events that he could not control. Presidents since Lincoln have discovered that. If the end brings me out all right, what is said against me won't mount to anything. But if the end brings me out wrong, then ten angels swearing I was right would make no difference, Lincoln once observed. A thought still true for our leaders today. Throughout it all, Abraham Lincoln never wavered and never broke. His tactics might change, but not his goal. In the end, brought him out magnificently. And so we celebrate his life and today the speech that many consider the finest in all American history. A speech in which he declared that new birth of freedom for our country. Lincoln told his audience that the world will little note and long remember what we say here. But in his eulogy of Lincoln, Senator Charles Sumner begged to differ, declaring that the world noted at once what he said and will never cease to remember it. Concluded Sumner, the battle itself was less important than the speech. Thank you. Mr. Donaldson, on behalf of the Gettysburg community, I'd like to call, thank you. Call me Sam. Sam, I'm happy to do that, Sam. <laughs> I'd like to thank you for participating in this ceremony this morning and, and for your remarks. They were quite eloquent. As a token of our appreciation, I'd like to present you with this painting. It's a painting by Dale Gallen entitled Of the People. This painting depicts President Lincoln's arrival in Gettysburg on the evening of November 18, 1863. Lincoln can be seen walking alongside William Johnson, David Wills, William Seward, Edward Everett, John Nicolay, and John Hay. This painting was commissioned by the Pennsylvania Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission to celebrate the 200th anniversary of Lincoln's birth and the 145th <coughs> anniversary of the Gettysburg Address. In addition to this painting, I'd also like to present you uh, with Abraham Lincoln, A Life That's Heavy, by the way. <laughs> it's a two-volume set. This is Michael Burlingame's masterpiece that exa examines the life of our 16th president from his impoverished upbringing to his legal career to his turbulent presidency. Last spring, this book was awarded the Lincoln Prize by the Gilder Lehrman Institute and Gettysburg College and was recognized as an extraordinary work of scholarship and a landmark contribution to Lincoln biography. Once again, Sam, thank you so much for joining us today. Ladies and gentlemen, the 16th President of the United States of America, Mr. Abraham Lincoln. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. 
We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this, but in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea. With a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free while God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth is marching on. Candidates for citizenship, as I call your name, please stand and remain standing through the oath of allegiance. James Fraser and Tassin Khan, formerly of Canada. George Babawi, Mina Ramis, Samuel Salama, formerly of Egypt. Francis Weedman, formerly of Great Britain. Sylvia Mankata Aguilar, formerly of Honduras. Farank Zalai, formerly of Hungary. Mabreen and Surrender Simon, formerly of India. Wee Ranjal, formerly of the People's Republic of China. Marissa Argilis, Jovic Husseina, and Jean Monter, formerly of the Philippines. Naomi and Kevin Baker, formerly of the United Kingdom. There is no more fitting place for us to conduct this ceremony. Not only because this ground is hallowed by the sacrifice of all the brave soldiers who fought for the United States of America, but because Many of those soldiers had not been born here. They came to this country and made it their home, just as you have come here and made it your home. And I ask that you dedicate yourselves to this country just as they did. Renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince Potentate, potentate, state or sovereignty, state or sovereignty of, whom or which, of whom or which 
I have heretofore been a subject or citizen that I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. that I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by law, that I will perform non-combatant service in the armed forces of the United States when required by law, that I will perform work of national importance Under civilian, direction, under civilian direction when required by law, when required by law. and that I, take this freely, and I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation, any mental reservation. Or, purpose or purpose of evasion. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, you're America's newest citizen. <laughs> It's an honor and a privilege to call you a fellow citizen of the United States of America. This is now officially your country, your home to protect, to defend, and to serve through active and engaged citizenship. Together, we are a nation united not by any one culture or ethnicity or ideology, but by the principles of opportunity, equality, and liberty that are enshrined in our founding documents. Today marks a very special day in your life. You've traveled a long path to get here. You've sworn a solemn oath to this country and now have all the rights of citizenship. Always remember that in America, no dream is impossible. Like the millions of immigrants who have come before you, you have the opportunity to enrich this country through your contributions to civic society, business, culture, and your community. You can help write the next great chapter in our American story, and together, we can keep the beacon that is America burning bright for all the world to see. I am proud to welcome you as a new citizen of this country. May God bless you, and may God continue to bless the United States of America. We give thanks for our time together this day, for the witness and service of President Abraham Lincoln, and for the sacrifice of those whose final resting place surrounds us. Help us to dedicate our lives to those unfinished tasks which remain before us as one people. Amen. <laughs>